Good morning, everybody. It's time uh, to start our uh, webinar. I think it's 10 o'clock now sharp. I hope to uh, welcome you all at our uh, event. I hope you'll constantly be sitting at, our, at your sofa or by your desk. Usually, we meet at one of the Baltic ports at this time of the season. We are meeting only this time due to the obvious reasons. However, our intention was to keep the routine and stay in touch with the Baltic ports with our friends from Baltic, from Europe and from the world. Therefore, we decided to organize this online gathering. Our two days webinars are short, much shorter than usual conference. So I hope despite your office duties, you will stay with us during these sessions. The title of our webinar is Adopting to Change the new reality of the port sector. It reflects very well the situation that we are facing now. The program is quite dense. So let's start our program. I would like to invite now uh, Kim Onaski, our chair chairman, to give his welcome words. Hello, Kimo. Are you there? I am here, Pokhtan. Hello to you. Very good. Are you in Kotka, Hamina, or elsewhere? I am today in Kotka. Very good. Kimo, take your role and, and give your welcome words. Thank you, Pokhtan. Hello, and welcome all to PPO webinar. Forty ports have experienced challenging times during the last months. Due to COVID-19 pandemic, Many countries closed their borders in the spring and introduced travel restrictions. In the first half of 2020, the number of ferry passengers reduced by a half. In April, May, ferry passengers almost disappeared. Moreover, the number of cruise ship calls has reduced almost to zero. Also, cargo volumes have been reduced significantly. Total volumes of 10 largest ports decreased by 5.5% and number of containers went down by 6.5%. The decrease of pickers and loss of traffic is quite exceptional in modern history. For many member ports, the situation is very hard. The need to deal with quite a substantial decrease of revenues and optimize the cost. But we also need to look for, towards the future because a challenge is always also an opportunity. Easy to say, much harder to cope with. But apart from the market challenges, Baltic ports have also shown how quickly we, the ports, adjusted to extraordinary situations and how important the ports are for securing the smooth transportation of goods, including medicines and first aid products essential for health of our societies. At this point, I would like to thank all the port workers, dockers, and people working at terminals, without whom the transportation of goods would not have been possible during these difficult times. All at all, we must not lose our optimism. Our after these challenges, there will be light in the future. Therefore, I am looking forward to hearing the discussions at the PPO webinar today and tomorrow. And I hope our speakers and panelists will show where this optimism is. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I wish you exciting times in front of your computers and I am also looking forward to meeting you face to face as soon as possible and at the very latest in the Baltic Ports Conference 
2021. It will be held in Tallinn as we had planned for this year. Thank you so much. Enjoy the webinar. Kimo, thank you very much for your uh, uh, welcome words. And uh, we are all missing face-to-face uh, -face, uh, meetings. So um, I'm really looking forward to meet you all, uh, well, within next month, if not uh, latest in a year time in Tallinn. And thank you also for presenting the last figures from the Baltic ports. And it is really indeed a challenging time for port sector. Well, let's continue. Uh, I would like to invite now uh, Mr. Przemek Myszka, Editor-in-Chief from the Baltic Port Journal. I think you all know Przemek very well. Przemek will lead and moderate uh, a webinar to the very end. Przemek, please take your role. Przemek will join us in a while. He's just standing next to me. Thank you all and see you online around. Thank you very much. See you. Good morning, afternoon and evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the digital shores of the internet. On the one hand, it's legit to feel downhearted that we're not meeting in person in Tallinn during this year's edition of the Baltic Ports Conference. On the other hand, though, we are fortunate enough to have technology on our side, transcending our physical limits to get people from the Baltic and beyond to partake in this hopefully insight-rich webinar, all in defiance of the coronavirus pandemic. My name is Przemek Myszka. I'm the chief editor of the Baltic Transport Journal and your showrunner for today and tomorrow. Before we start the fireworks, the organizers would like to give the thumbs up to the event sponsors, BRT and Greek Connect, two long-lasting supporters of the BPO, plus ION, a tech company from the US who I sincerely hope will find the Baltic hospitable. Right, off we go now with the first presentation. I made an attempt to find intel on the economic impact of the 1918 Spanish flu, but was surprised how little I could find. Quite the reverse, the COVID-19 pandemic has attracted, aside from the obvious health studies, a significant body of growing research on the very nature of implications for the global and regional economies, not to mention journalistic slash activist writing from restoring the status quo to overhauling capitalism. Please join me in welcoming Jarle Hammer, shipping advisor from Hammer Maritime Strategies, who will dissect the matter at hand. Jarle, please. Thank you. Well, I'm a business economist and political scientist. I've been a research director with Fernlis, big ship brokers in Norway, and working on my own as an advisor in recent years. I will give a brief overview of megatrends in key markets, international shipping, and also a brief uh, survey of macroeconomics in the Baltic states. In general, Expectations have been lowered once and twice. So uh, we see setbacks which are uh, of different magnitude in different countries and different industries. But um, let's start with an 
an overview of world seaborne trade last year. Energy is about 41% of global seaborne trade. And this is shrinking year by year because we use energy more efficiently and we have new renewable types coming up like solar and wind and so on. We see that most of the oil is shipped as crude, the dark blue and the light blue is oil products and the oil products is increasing their share because of downstream involvement in oil producing countries. They want to sell oil products and not just the crude. Then we have the gas and uh, I cannot uh, take too much time uh, on each uh, during 15, 20 minutes. But um, coal is still there and very much so, not maybe so much in Poland anymore. But um, construction is about 22% of what is shipped. And that is mainly iron ore and nickel and also <coughs> different ferro alloys. We have the steel products and we have the scrap to be remelted into steel. That has been growing quite a lot, but we have seen stagnation, but lately a very surprising development in China, which I will revert to. Then we have food and fertilizer around 5% and a host of different dry bulk commodities, 16, same as container volume. And then we have other dry cargo commodities and the pink slice that is chemical. What is most vulnerable in times of economic setback is definitely construction business. So that will then hurt both the raw materials to make steel and steel products themselves. Also, the container business is quite vulnerable. Luxury can wait. We can postpone uh, purchase of consumer electronics and by the way, also cars and so on. If you take a look at the world fleet over quite some decades, we see that the tanker fleet took 30 years to become as big as it was around 1980. And that was due to the Iran, Iraq, Iran war, higher prices, and also very much due to the successes in the North Sea with a lot of oil and gas becoming available. Then towards the end of the period, we see the dry bulk fleet exploding. And that has to do with the fantastic industrial takeoff in China. If you take a look at the most recent development and also for a quite long period, by the way, we see that the stock markets, they have increased to record levels. We see setbacks and a very strong one late 2008, the financial crisis, and then the dry bulk market collapsed completely. And now it's hovering at quite low levels, and we see traces of some setbacks of different types. In the stock markets, one have, has feared double dips and triple dips, and we see a strong impact of uh, the corona recently, but uh, it's amazing how high the stock market is. So there could be very well be reason for corrections. If we take a look at raw material prices, we see the red, that is the iron ore, actually much more volatile than ore, the dots, blue dots. And recently the iron ore price is on the rise again. This is a almost incredible illustration showing the importance of Asia in the dry bulk market. That is for the three largest commodity like iron ore, coal and grains, including soybeans, 80% of it. Then you have Europe and the other continents very modest on the import side. Admittedly, we have also a lot of minor bulk commodities, but this is very interesting to observe. And also this one, Take a look at the steel production in China since 1990. We thought it was um, 
going to decrease a bit with the stagnation in the population with a lot of uh, construction for speculation and empty cities around. And you see uh, the setbacks in uh, uh, the EU countries in uh, 2009, but in China, it was the opposite. They imported a lot of cheap uh, iron ore. But take a look at the last one and a half year. Early last year, China and the rest of the world produced about the same amount of steel. In July, there was a gap of 57%. So whereas the other world is decreasing, China is increasing. And I think that this could have something to do with the Belt and Road or New Silk Road project. A lot of infrastructure investments in uh, neighboring countries and also within China itself. Expectations for the cargo volumes this year, you see it's a bit slow in 2020, very uncertain. It could very well decrease even more. But the iron ore is kept up quite well due to the imports to China. In the energy market, this is up to and including 2019. Uh, we see a modest increase in oil, we see a modest increase in gas and leveling out on the coal side. At the bottom, we see a green line and that is the renewable energy. The US Energy uh, Information Administration gives surveys and forecasts every month of expected oil production and consumption. And you see this very significant decrease uh, um, first and second quarter, some recovery, but oil consumption this year will be much lower than last year, and hence also the seaborne trade in oil. This is showing a stagnation and decrease in oil consumption in the EU countries, also US sharp decrease in Japan, whereas we see the strong increase in China and India. And this is a quite dramatic illustration. It shows an index for GDP in industrial countries, OECD countries. Green is energy consumption and red is oil consumption. So whereas the economy has tripled, the oil consumption is pretty flat. And that means a dramatic decrease in oil intensity in the economies. And recently, Saudi Arabia announced a production cut, but before that, they increased production very much, reflected in the Middle East OPEC curve at the top. They were to cooperate with Russia in uh, reducing production in order to defend the oil price. And what happened in the tanker market? There was an incredible spike. There was a rush for floating storage. Oil that was not in demand had to be put somewhere and floating storage was the easiest. This meant that 14% of the tanker fleet was suddenly used for storage. And that re reduced the pool of tonnage seeking, no, cargo seeking vessels. And you can see the <laughs> dramatic decrease. So it's not easy to make budgets for spot market participation, but the time charter market isn't that much uh, fluctuating. On the general cargo side, <coughs> container trade saw a substantial setback late 2008 and 2009, and it's also expected to decrease quite a lot this year. In contrast, a lot of vessels have been ordered and the fleet will increase and hence the tonnage balance will deteriorate for container vessels. At the bottom we see a rather flat curve for Roro vessels and of course they have an advantage compared with the 
trail, uh, rail and uh, trucks uh, over long distances when they can make shortcuts across the Baltic, Baltic. but it is a very local business, shipping business, uh, really. This shows container time charter rates, and it has not increased very much towards the end because here we have included larger sizes. So if you look at the blue, red, and green curves through the period, you see at the bottom a slight recovery, but this is very lousy. And we have a substantial slow steaming, meaning that there is a very big fleet reserve capacity if we speed up. And that means a long way to a healthy market. What about the shipbuilders? The blue is showing the contracting volumes in gross tons, uh, and the green, a much more smooth delivery curve, and the red is showing demolition sales. So the contracting business and vessel prices, rather modest. What about the Baltic countries? Well, I have looked up from the OECD for countries, members of CBSS. Other members are Russia, but they have the Pacific, they have the Black Sea and the Arctic and so on. But of course, they are a major player. Iceland, not so interesting in this context. And Norway, not actually being a Baltic country, is a member of this council. If we look at the industrial production in Baltic countries, we see the strongest setback in Germany and Poland. Norway is uh, hovering at a pretty stable level, I think supported by uh, oil prices recovering quite a lot from a very, very low level. And if we look at the trade volumes, we see Germany, well, this is actually not volume, it's value. Then we see a setback in exports and imports. We observe that Germany is a substantial net exporter. Poland has about the same setback, maybe even slightly more in the trade, which is generally fairly balanced. As for the four Nordic countries, we see rather stable uh, developments comparatively, although some decrease. And the Baltic, three Baltic countries, also some more decrease. So this uh, concludes my brief overview uh, uh, of the global markets. And uh, there are a lot of interesting topic topics to discuss, for sure. And uh, that will be interesting to follow up on at another occasion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jarla. A lot of food for thought. Now, before we move to the panel debate, a quick question to your Jarla. Stepping back and looking at the bigger uh, picture, if you were to place all your money on a single trend event development that will shape the global economy in the coming months and years, what would it be? Are we talking about the world economy striving to go back to the status quo, or are we talking about uh, redesigning how we trade, how we ship things, how we consume? What's your best take on that topic? Let me first say what I would not bet on, and that is uh, the tanker business. I think that we will have less travel by planes. We will have uh, less driving, uh, because of the, the general situation. And also there is a strive for greener energy and that will continue. I'm just thinking about my country, uh -huh. all the efforts to do something else than oil and gas. 
uh, I'm uh, more confident actually on uh, the dry bulk side. I think uh, you will not see the growth rates of the past, but it's interesting if you look at the weather situation, the verse, the storms and the hurricanes and the rain and the flooding, the more you will need of dry bulk material, mm -hmm. steel and cement for construction, protection and so on. Uh, so that's something to bear in mind. And uh, I think the container trade will always be there. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe dry bulk, which has been, uh, <laughs> well, it, it's, you know, one country is driving it. <laughs> and that is China to a very, very dramatic, in my view, extent. And, and this illustration of the steel production in China and the rest of the world with a 57% gap arising in less than two years. So I'm not sure I would invest very much in shipping <laughs> right now. <laughs> That's a bit pessimistic, but talking about China, what's your take on the clash between China and the US and Europe, Europe sitting in between, including the Baltic and how the New Silk Road or more general, the Belt and Road Initiative sits within the larger scheme of things. I think Belt and Road is one of the most positive drivers. Uh, disagreement between the superpowers is negative for sure. And will dampen, uh, I think, uh, trade volumes to some extent. We have seen uh, fairly recently problems in the soybean exports from the US to China, but that was substituted almost immediately by Brazil. Uh -huh. And so the, the trade is uh, finding a new direction. So uh, in general, I'm a bit more confident for dry bulk than for tank, for sure. And I think that container will have quite some way to come back. Because as I mentioned, this, slow steaming should not be underestimated. Mm -hmm. If markets would be very good, you will sail as fast as possible to have as many voyages as, as possible, as long as it lasts. So uh, yeah, there are so many uh, very, very interesting variables in uh, these scenarios. Indeed. Thank you very much, Jarle, once again for your presentation and for your insights, a big round of applause for you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Now we are heading to the first discussion, panel titled Facing the Post-COVID-19 Pandemic Challenges, Global Trade Shifts, Production, Relocation, Supply Chain, Resilience, and New Customer Habits. Let me introduce the panelists. We've got with us Isabella Rigbos, Secretary General of the European Sea Ports Organization, the Port of Gdynia's Outer Port Gdynia Project Manager Maciej Krzesiński, Port of Helsinki's Chief Executive Ville Hapasari, and the Ports of Stockholm's Chief Commercial Officer Johan Balen. Are we all here? Nice to meet you in these unpresented conditions. Hope that you are all feeling uh, well. We are waiting for you, Han. Can we have you on video as well? Okay, let us kick off uh, the discussion. Isabel, could you be so kind and give us an overview of how has the pandemic affected the port industry Europe-wide. Have ports, as a result of the crisis, ironed out a code of conduct, how to approach this situation and any other similar in the future, so as to keep their supply chain role functional? 
Yes, uh, good morning, everyone, um, and thank you for, for inviting us. And I very much regret that, that uh, this year we have to do it uh, from the computer. But uh, I hope this is a, an exceptional format, and next year we see each other, and I see all the Baltic ports on this. On this uh, because it's always the first conference of this, the conference season, uh, the, the Baltic ports conference. So I hope to see you next year. Um, yeah, it's a, it has been a, a very difficult period, but at the same time, I, I like to be positive. Huh? I mean, the, the, what we have seen is that in, in the most extreme lockdown countries, let's say even the, the countries that are, were most affected by the virus, that ports have remained operational, that they were open, that we, they were functioning, that they quickly had um, very well established contingency plans, that they were looking for, for um, in like in 24 hours for solutions for certain issues like uh, lack of storage and so on. Very so they have been very agile and and very flexible. And I think this is an important message because this has also opened the eyes of many policymakers. Because you know I am in Brussels representing the 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 ports here and this i think it's something uh, a lesson for for everyone to show these ports are have are playing a critical role in the supply of goods in the, in the supply of medical material and of well-being of the people and and uh, the continuation of economic life so i think this is uh, this is very important if we look at the figures um we have the Q1 and Q2 figures, but not of all ports, but it's clear that, that I mean, this is never seen, um, starting from, from the worst sector in the most affected sector in, in this kind of cruise, where I see on our Excel sheets minus 100. This is unbelievable. Uh, but then um, also, of course, in um, freight, I think with the figures that we have, we would be saying an average of minus 15% on, on, for instance, containers maybe, uh, but this depends a bit on, on where we, from which countries we speak, and it's a Q2 uh, figures, uh, so uh, we will have to see that uh, for the whole year. Uh, Roro has also been uh, very much affected in Q2. Um, and, and passenger ferries as well. I mean, we, we now even minus 80, minus 70. Uh, I mean, these are really figures that we have for Q2. I think the important thing or will be to see how Q, Q3 is, um, because in fact, the lockdowns are finished in most of the countries. There are some uh, restrictions, but uh, the, the economy is, uh, people are working again. Um, production units are working again so and restarting uh, so we we have to see what happens there but at the same time we will also see in this q3 i think the first signs of the economic crisis and there are many sectors who have been affected people are starting to 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 lose their jobs in a way so how will this affect consumption and so on and and port business uh, what is also important is that it depends on the port and on your connectivities. Uh, we had in the beginning of the year, January, February, China, where the virus was, then Europe, and now it's South America. So for, uh, uh, ports that are dealing mainly, for instance, with South America are maybe affected now. So you have this uh, disruption, I think. The big challenge I see, and I, I won't take too much time, is that uh, it's very, uh, and I think the ports here in the panel can probably confirm that, how do you make a long-term strategy or a strategy for the next period? I mean, do we, are we getting over that and over the, the, the worst of this crisis in the next months? Will this take a year? So that is very important and very difficult because uh, ports uh, need to make, I mean, it's heavy assets, um, entities, so they need to plan to cater for capacity for, and so on. This takes time, and if your market is so much moving, it will uh, require uh, a lot of flexibility from the ports, and this will be very challenging. Um, so that is a big thing. And just to end, because what we did uh, last week, we were looking at the crisis 2008-2009. Um, we can't compare these this crisis with the 2008-2009. But what we have seen in 2008-2009, the economy went down, the European economy by 4%, and the ports 
volumes went down by 12%. But then from 2009 to 2010, we have seen that the economy, European economy, uh, restored by 2%. And the ports were restoring by 6%. And I think this is a, a, a positive note, maybe, to say, like, we are heavily affected by such crises, but we also rebound quickly. So we ports are resilient, and let's hope, if we can compare to crises, that this will happen as well for ports. Thank you very much. Now, Maciej. Gdynia is Poland's biggest cruise port, also serving hundreds of thousands of passengers in ferry traffic to and from Sweden. What has been the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on Gdynia's passenger traffic? Uh, hello, welcome you very warmly from Gdynia, Port Authority. Uh, of course, uh, we can say that in Gdynia, as in other Baltic ports, we noted a significant, significant decrease in passenger traffic. Uh, while the ferry service uh, last year amounted to nearly 700,000 passengers for the whole of the 2019, and over uh, a half a million from January to August, this year we have over uh, 280,000 passengers in the same period. The worst months uh, were, of course, the lockdown moment. It was in uh, March and April in Vienna, uh, where the typical uh, passenger traffic particularly died out, but fortunately the, the, this gap was filled uh, by the movement of truck drivers, uh, where we even recorded some increases. Uh, therefore, while we uh, have a similar level of transshipments, uh, we estimate that this year the traffic uh, on Paris will be lower by about uh, 45 percent. Uh, uh, in the case of cruise ships, uh, we can talk about a completely west, west season as, uh, uh, as the first course or planet for October this year. Uh, all of uh, others have been cancelled this year, so uh, we can say that uh, in traffic of uh, passenger, it's, uh, it will be very low this year. But uh, if we can uh, say about the general cargo uh, and the cargo relative to Port of the Authority, uh, we have decreasing only about 0.5% uh, uh, year to year. So I think that it's uh, not so bad information for, for, for the Port of Dynia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I've asked this question because the Port of Dynia is constructing a brand new next level passenger terminal. And now, don't you fear that it may now take noticeably more time for this investment to rise to its potential, both when it comes to passenger volumes, as well as attracting shipping clients willing to venture opening a new route to and from Gdynia? Uh, of course, this is a uh, concern that the payback period may be slightly longer, but uh, uh, on the other hand, looking at all of infra infrastructure projects in, in, in our port, they are prepared on a multi-annual basis. Our plans uh, often reach uh, 30 or more years into the future, so one or two years don't make such a big difference to us. And uh, the pandemic will finally end. I, I, I think so, <laughs> I hope. Uh, nevertheless, we are already starting work today to ensure that the, the new ferry terminal, which will be launched next year in the period from uh, June to September, uh, we we'll serve more than one operator. Today we have only one operator in Gdynia, it's uh, Stenaline, as you know. Uh, but uh, I think that we will have uh, the second one in the new ferry terminal. Uh, we would like to strengthen uh, our sea motorway to Barcelona, but we are looking for hard on uh, putting the new connections into operation. And it seems that everything is on the right track. Uh, in addition, we perceive that. The, the shifts for the ferry market uh, as an opportunity rather than a threat on our case. Uh, I hope that uh, our new ferry infrastructure, as all well as the constantly developing access infrastructure, are attractive to current and potential ship owners and cargo operators. Uh, we are strongly developing railways, for example, uh, and intermodal, of course, and uh, north south motorway connections are developing very strongly. Uh, so this is an opportunity for the, especially for the Nordic countries to connect with Southern and Central Europe by, of course, taking advantage of the good location of the Polish ports, uh, which is the 
Thank you very much. I'm also very much looking forward to the new ferry terminal because, as I used to say, there are two groups of people, those who like boarding a ferry and those who are wrong. Yes. <laughs> now, um, uh, Villa, tough times for the port on the passenger front too. Traffic essentially cut in half. What can a port do in cooperation with shipping clients and the state to try to weather down the storm? And like Gdynia, aren't you concerned that the corona crisis will seriously hamper the short to medium term feasibility of the ferry and rower and cruise investments, including onshore power supply for cruisers? You are carrying within the Twin Link and Hansa Link, uh, Twin Port and Hansa Link projects. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is tough times indeed. In in our case, passenger traffic stopped due to the lockdown in March, and and after then two months of practically no passenger traffic. We have we have had gradual recovery during summer, but still the volumes were more or less minus 50% of the normal ones. Now, now again, when the autumn has begun, the situation has gotten a bit worse and, and the limitations regarding traveling have increased. So what we are looking at now is on the passenger side, very much uncertainties for the rest of the year. In Helsinki, in normal, in normal year, we have over 12 million passengers annually and now for 2020, we are struggling to get even half of that. And on the cruise sector, which is a bit over half a million passengers, we we haven't had, had any cruise calls for this year. And, and even for the next season, it is pretty much a question mark. On the cargo side, on the other hand, we have not been affected so drastically, even though the volumes are lower to the previous year levels, we are looking at something minus six, minus eight percent, depending on the cargo segment. But like Isabel said earlier, we are seeing now this autumn the effects of the economic crisis. And I think the outlook is not short, temporary one, but we are we are looking at lower volume, yes, now for, for some time. Uh, as for what we have done, I think our main focus on cargo side has been on cargo and passenger side has been safeguarding the operations during the COVID-19 and in that we have succeeded quite well. Uh, then on the passenger side there have been quite many let's say new methods and processes in order to have safe traveling in terminals and on the vessels that has meant new procedures and communicating those in every channels. What has been good has been the, the let's say, that cooperation with the authorities like border guards, social health care authorities, all our customers, shipping companies, and operators in the terminals. And, and in all of that, I think that one of the biggest things in this exceptional crisis has been that, that everybody has to communicate the situation very actively. As, to the, as for the end customers, but also to the public, to raise public awareness. Uh, you asked for the support measures. We have for shipping companies, other customers and tenants, we have had temporary adjustments in rents, payment terms, layoff charges. And, and we have been quite active with the Finnish Port Association in lobbying also for the state aids for the traveling and traveling sector and shipping companies especially. I think overall the close cooperation is, is essential and and that is that goes also for the for us ports. So we have had for example very close co-op with Tallinn and Stockholm and the target is to have similar procedures along the passenger journey in these exceptional times. If I, if I reflect the whole, whole of this half a year period with home offices and teams meetings and now Zoom webinars, it has kind of forced us to find new ways to communicate with customers and stakeholders. And at least one good thing has been that in some cases the meetings are much easier to schedule. But naturally, like this webinar or any other meetings, it 
be much nicer and fruitful to meet face to face. Uh, for the other question regarding investments, practically for this year, we our our turnover has been cut so dramatically, so we've been forced to do cut, cost cutting measures on every let's say every frontier, including the investments as well. So we have cut this year's investment program by one third and postponed quite many say planned investments but still the most important ones we are going through and for example here in Warsaw we, we started stretching our fairway here and it should be deepened by two meters during this and next year. Other important let's say project sector is the let's say environmental investments. We are targeting carbon neutrality and therefore we are we are going through with the onshore power supply equipment practically one or two installations per year and as for the cruise sector which has, which has the biggest question marks uh, we had first onshore power supply equipment planned for 22 23 so so we still have time to monitor the situation and i think overall that's important that we need to be prepared that that if this let's say pandemic phase continues longer so that we can adjust our planning for the 21 and 22. But I think overall we still see this situation as a more as a temporary one and the investments the ports are doing are done for decades. So in that sense, we, we believe that the most important ones you have to carry through and, the ex and anyway, the payback will come there at the end. So I think that reflects also the optimism what's, which Kimo was urging for in his in opening speech. Thank you very much. Now, Johan, can you also update us on what's happening on the passenger side across your three ports? In what way Corona has affected the particular trade lanes Stockholm, Nineshamn and Kappel who are serving? with Finland and the Oland Islands, Estonia, Latvia, Poland, as well as the Isle of Gotland. Yes, thank you. Well, as, as you as you rightfully said, we are we are in charge of, of, of three ports uh, from from the north in Kapelskär and then in the inner city of Stockholm and then Nynäshamn. And during this, right in the middle of the pandemic, we, we've opened a, a fourth port as well. Uh, but of course, uh, being well, one, I mean, I think we share the same uh, experience a little bit as, as Ville before in many ways. Um, um, so, I mean, being a, a very, I mean, dependent on the, the passenger segments, both ferry and cruise with 12 million passengers per year, I think we are looking at about, we're happy if we reach 4 million passengers this year. So it's, it's a, a, a drastic drop uh, especially when the borders are closed um, and, and the important uh, ferry lines between Finland and Sweden and, and the Baltic states are of course heavily affected. Um, so um, and that, as well as, as the cruise um, uh, season disappeared almost completely, we, we had uh, two, more than 280 uh, cruise calls booked for this uh, season. Uh, we have seen a few and expect a few more of, of what they, the, the cruise lines called scenic cruises, where they basically just come and, and, uh, um, and visit the, the port without anyone uh, disembarking. Or, or so, so uh, at least that's some hope that, that there is a market for, for the cruise industry. But uh, it's, it's been a, a tremendous drop for our revenue and, and, and it's, it's a completely new situation for us. As well, when the pandemic started, we, we made a decision to, to half our, our, uh, our port dues, also try to help our, especially our, our ferry lines uh, to also support the, that we could secure the, uh, the, the, the flow of cargo. Uh, so not only, I mean, when the passengers disappeared, that at least the cargo would, would uh, uh, and the, the supplies to the greater Stockholm region would uh, still still get through. And 
and we're really happy that that we could uh, keep a lot of the ferry lines open or all the, all the ferry lines open. Um, some of them have, have changed pattern, so we have seen more of the cargo moving out from the inner city of Stockholm to the to the ports of Oninesan and and uh, and Kapellskär. Um, so and that has also been been quite challenging for our stevedores uh, to cope with the, with the new situation. Um, but it, it's it's very we're very happy to see that that uh, uh, that the handling has been okay and uh, I mean the traffic is still is still open uh, more or less. So so uh, but it it's it definitely is a big setback for us and it's 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 going to be very interesting to see how how long term this uh, situation is going to going to be. Takar Johan. Um, unfortunately, we will have to leave it there because we have one more uh, presentation uh, to be squeezed in session one. That said, I would like to thank you very warmly for your input on the situation across the port industry in Europe, including the Baltic. A big round of applause to you and please stay with us to see other presentations and uh, the following uh, debates. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, session one needs only one more finishing touch to be done by James Hosken, who is the asset management specialist at VRT Finna. Using the Finnish port of Pietrasari as a case study, James will tell us how to catapult port asset management to the 21st century. James, bring it on. Good morning. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, as I said, I'm James Hoskin I'm from Gisco. I'm a 3D asset management specialist. And I'm here today to talk to you not about our new funky Gisco t-shirts, but rather um, bringing port asset management into the 21st century. So I've prepared a little presentation um, that goes through a uh, particular case study, one port we've worked very closely with um, over the last year. So if I share my screen with you now, hopefully I'll, uh, I'll talk you through our presentation. Um, but COVID has obviously affected the port industry um, in more ways than just economic, um, particularly now in this post-COVID crisis that we have virtual meetings, uh, social distancing, and remote working, um, it's more important than ever that asset managers have a system where they can digitally manage their assets remotely, um, but most importantly, communicate that information with internal and external stakeholders. Um, so luckily, we here at Gisco, we've already created a solution for this, so you don't have to do that. Um, and Gisco was created by the survey company VRT Finland, um, they were pioneers of using multi-beam sonar for underwater structural surveys um, and they collect all this wonderful 3D data for bridges, ports, pipelines, harbours. Uh, but the big issue is what do you do with this 3D data? Um, and that's where our clientele comes in. So we've worked with over 100 ports across Europe, including um, Dover, Amsterdam, uh, Hamina Kotka. And it's actually our collaboration with Hamina Kotka where Gisbro really began to take shape. They're a very forward thinking port and they understood the value that this 3D data has if it can be presented in an easy to use online platform where they can actually utilize the data in their daily decision making process. Um, so big thanks to Hamina Kotka for helping us out with this. Um, it's, their forward-thinking attitude that's actually earned them the title of the world's most uh, intelligent digital seaport. Um, I'll go to the next slide. But today I'm going to talk to you about the case study of the port of Pietrasari. It's a small port based on the west coast of Finland with about 1.4 million tonnes of freight traffic. That was in 2017. Um, approximately one kilo of, uh, one kilometre, sorry, of kilos. And our cooperation with them started in 2018, where we performed some hydrographic surveys using our multi-beam and LIDAR scanners to scan their below and above water structures. And then in the following year, we came back and did some aerial drone surveys so we could survey 
the port um, and the surrounding areas and uh, create a digital terrain model. And then this year, uh, we've combined all that information. So all their below water surveys with their above water surveys, we've put all that information into GISGRO along with the relevant data for their assets. And now they have a complete working model, a digital twin, if you like, of their port that they can use daily uh, to enhance their operations. So now I'm going to talk through a little bit about uh, what you can do in GISCRO, um, how it can aid ports in their decision making process and um, provide some real life examples from the, pure, the port of Piatrasari. So asset related data is available on a map. So as you can see here, we've got a 2D map. You can switch between uh, map and satellite. And most importantly, you can add assets, create them into categories. Um, on the right hand side here, where you see the asset section, you have what's called the layers. So you can turn on and off certain layers. So for example, if you wanted to see your, uh, your water pipelines, your electrical cables, you could turn off all your assets and just see those particular type of assets. Uh, and you can add data to assets uh, more importantly. So an example of this is the warehouse, as you can see on the screen, R7. Oh, one um, minute, Dennis. Yeah. Can I just bump in and uh, say that your screen is not shared? Can you? Oh, my apologies. Yeah, it's the green big button at the very bottom. Is that better? Can you see it now? Yes, I can see it. Awesome. My apologies. Okay, much appreciated. Please. Did you see? Did you see it at the beginning? No, just now. Okay, so here's uh, here's the uh, underwater survey we did for them in 2018. Um, here is the above water survey we did in 2019, and now in 2020 we've combined all their surveys and their assets into one system. Uh, as you can see here on the map, here is the asset related data. So um, this is what I was talking about. Um, you can see on the screen there, there's certain assets and in the layer setting, you can turn on and off certain assets. So I can see here, they've got their bollards, their bulk storage, their gate control, uh, among other things. And what you can do here is you can turn on and off certain assets in the layer settings. So um, if you just wanted to see, for example, your uh, water pipelines or your electrical cables, you can isolate that very asset and see it on the 2D map. Uh, you can add data to assets. So you can add pictures, videos, documents, text, anything you like. Um, and a good example of this is if you have a warehouse in your port, um, you can put in the description who it's rented to, who it's owned by, its storage space, you can attach files. So I can see there they've attached a, a rental agreement for this warehouse. So it's a really easy way of combining valuable data for your assets in one place. And you can add tags to asset. So certain assets are gonna share certain characteristics. So you can add tags. So for example, this one here is an electrical outlet. It's in the area one to three and it's used by operator one. Um, and what this allows you to do is you can search uh, by function, by asset name, by tag. Um, if you're managing multiple areas, so if you have three or four ports that you're digitally managing in, in GISCRO, that's a lot of assets. So if you want to find them uh, quite quickly, you can use the, uh, the tag function. Um, now, life isn't perfect, unfortunately. We all do get repairs that we have to do from now and then, and um, in GISCRO, we have, a, we have a designated part of our software that helps you with repairing assets. So what you can do is you can, in the 3D view or the 2D view, if you notice a problem, um, you can right click and list it for repair. So for example, in this one, I can see there has been a hole in the road, there's been a pothole, and they've listed it for repair in GISCRO. And once you've listed it for repair, it gives you the exact coordinates um, and you can also designate a person in charge. So if you want to select who's in charge of repairing this asset, um, then you can select them from the menu there. And you can also give it a remark status. So is it open, ongoing, prepared? Is it on hold? Um, and what this allows you to do is actually send digital work orders to your subcontractors. So sometimes repairs can't be done in-house and you have to bring in your subcontractors. 
So within Giscro, you can actually send a digital work order to your subcontractor. Similar to how the repair system works, you list the assets, you give it a description, um, and then you select who's in charge of this, attach some files, and then most importantly, this can be digitally sent to your subcontractor. They receive uh, a work order. It looks a little bit like what's on the left-hand side of the screen. So they get all the uh, asset data you've attached to it. They get the attachments and they also get a overview of that asset um, via the map. And of course, you can actually turn off certain assets if you don't want them to be able to see that uh, in the map view. And then quite conveniently, we've got a section where you can monitor all your current work orders, what's the status of them, um, and also your repairs and comments. There's also a section in the 2D map where you can monitor those separately. Uh, you can schedule inspections. Um, so it's really important to do uh, routine inspections of your assets. Um, and with this function, um, you can actually designate people to go and inspect certain assets. So um, if you select the person, the inspection date, how frequent you want this inspection to be, um, give it a description. So for instance, in this one, it's an inspection of the conditions of the key walls. Um, and then you can actually digitally select the asset groups that you've listed in GISCRO. Um, so a good example of this is if you imagine I've been assigned uh, the job of inspecting some bollards, I get an email coming through saying, hey, James, it's your job to go and inspect these bollards. Um, and if I'm out there looking at the bollards and I notice an issue, I can actually use my phone to fill in this inspection report. I could take a photo of the bollard and it will take the exact location of my phone and uh, that photo will be attached to that asset using its location. So it's a really neat way of connecting, um, uh, connecting your assets for inspections. And uh, you can integrate real-time AIS data. So this is from marinetraffic.com. Um, and what you can do is you can actually integrate all your AIS data into GISCRO. So when you click on a ship, you get its last position, its arrival area, its birth, its estimated arrival time, its departure time, its agents. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to plan your vessel allocation. So obviously each ship has a certain depth it needs for clearance. So you can actually plan the ships coming in and out of your port for loading and unloading um, and make it a bit more efficient. And now here you have the survey data um, in a visual format. So um, if you have that 3D data, you can open that as well. And you can see here on the near shore, we've got the uh, multi-beam uh, sonar surveys, which cover all the underwater structure. And then we've got the uh, drone models, which we surveyed on top of that as well. Uh, in the 3D, you've got some really cool options that you can do. Um, so you can add comments, repairs, assets. So I can see here they've got all their bollards um, listed here. And if you notice any repairs that need doing or any asset information or any comments you want to make on the 3D data, you can do that from inside the 3D viewer. Uh, it also allows you to make measurements. So if you want to do specific type of calculations, measuring distance, for example, um, you can do that. So a good example of this here is you can see they're measuring um, the bottom from the seabed up to the top of the key wall. Um, and we have quite a range of measurements that you can use in GISCRO. So for example, here we have a cross section and all the measurements that you use, so um, measuring distance, cross sections, um, polylines, polygons, you can export them as a DXF um, to go into a different software. So if your engineers are using a third party software, then don't worry because you can export that and open that in that software. Um, now we have bathymetric charts. So in GISCRO, you have the option uh, to make bathymetric charts uh, and you can adjust the contour resolution and the sounding spacing, sound, sounding spacing, sorry. Uh, this is a really important function, obviously, related to the AIS data. So you have to know the depth um, of certain locations. So bathymetric charts can be made with just three clicks of the button. Um, we have depth colors. Um, and you can also make um, certain depth colors in the settings on the left-hand side. So if you want to work with 
uh, a certain specification within your port, then you can do that and save it for future use. We have depth visualization. So uh, obviously it's really important uh, for ships to have a safe depth. Um, that's really important. Um, and here you can actually set the target depth. So you can see on the screen that it's at minus 13. So all the areas uh, below and above that area will be displayed. Uh, most importantly, with this depth visualization tool, it relates to volume calculations. So dredging is obviously a really important part of a, of a port's life. So in GISGRO, um, we can actually calculate certain areas of volume. So if you go to the measurement tools and then click on volume calculation, you can draw around the survey area that you want to calculate the volume for. And then once you select the cut height, it will tell you the cut volume, the fill volume, the planner area. Uh, and again, this can be exported into a DXF. So if you have some type of dredging software, um, this file can go straight into that. Uh, comparison to data sets. So we routinely survey uh, the same areas uh, every year. So if you've got a survey from 2015, 2017, and then 2019, you can actually compare um, the change in those two surveys. So you can overlap them uh, and see how things have uh, changed during those times. Um, that's really important actually for budget allocation. So you can see the status of an asset and how it's deteriorating or how it's holding up. And that actually allows you to plan your budget more effectively. Um, so once you see the change or um, the difference between the two surveys, um, you can actually plan your budget for when you need to repair certain assets. Um, so example here is the cross section. You can see there's a cross section from 2015 and a cross section from 2017. And then the bathymetric um, chart over there, you can see the differences um, above and below that target depth. Um, the big question is why, why, why GISGRO? Uh, it saves time and costs, um, and we, we all love that. So it minimizes the software costs and cuts the hassle. Uh, it's a really easy to use software. So a big question I get is, is how difficult is GISGRO to use? It's an online cloud-based GIS platform. That's a very wordy sentence. It sounds very complicated, uh, but in reality, it's, it's so simple to use. Whether you're new to software, or you're an experienced software user, GISGRO is for you. Um, whether you're an engineer or you're just having an overview of the port, uh, it's a really easy to use and functional software. Uh, it optimizes asset operations. So it's an easy to use tool, uh, including all the things I mentioned, the measurements, the bathymetric charts, volume calculations, and much more. Um, you can increase your efficiency by communicating directly in the platform with everyone needed. Um, and a real important thing related to this um, is what Ville said er earlier about communication. Um, with GISGRO, um, if you have a license package which contains 10 users, it means you can have up to 10 people logging in using GISGRO at once. So you could have uh, a login for the uh, Harbour Master, you could have a login for your architect, you could have a login for your engineers. Um, so it allows everyone to input information so you're all getting a real-time, up-to-date view of what's going on in the report. Uh, it maximizes asset value, so it cuts maintenance costs, improves safety, and extends the lifetime of assets. And for doing this, you can optimize your planning and design projects, and most importantly, enhance innovation, be forward-thinking, and be where the market is growing. And the benefits of GISGRO to the asset managers, the ones who are actually using it, um, I can actually use some real life statistics from the port of Munakotka. So 15 to 20% cost reduction on supplier subcontractor costs for maintenance work, up to 25% savings on working hours for maintenance, management and planning, a 25 to 50% cost reduction over time on inspection costs, and 10% cost savings on manpower for sales managing. So it's gonna make you more efficient. It's gonna help you save money. Um, and I think that's pretty much, uh, yeah, that's the last slide of my presentation. Um, what I will say, if you want more information on how GISGRO can help you in your port, then uh, go to our website, www.gisgro.com. Um, all our contact details are there. There's a free trial that you can use. So if you haven't got any data, then don't worry. We've got a free trial. You can uh, 
set up and have a play with. And uh, yeah, don't be afraid to get in contact and uh, give us a call. Thank you very much, James. Top notch, high Polish stuff. Mm. The key takeaway for me is that while the digital revolution is going on and we've got artificial intelligence, this blockchain, this big data, big data, this at big players and including big ports are pushing it. It's good to hear that smaller ports also have the capacity to go uh, digital. That's great. Thank you very much once again, James. And we are a bit before, uh, behind the schedule. We will take a short break now and we will get back to you in five minutes. So a quarter past 11. See you then.
Welcome back after the break, as we set the scene for Deloitte's Indra Wong, by no means a stranger to the port industry in the Baltic, and who will cast light on what it means to be a smart port from a crisis angle. All righty, yes, hello everyone. Um, not sure if you're seeing the full screen, by the way. I don't think so for some reason. Ah, there we go. There we go. So hello everyone. Yes, it's it's a bit different, of course, to, to do it like this. And well, that's also the topic of the presentation. Um, basically on, on how um, well, COVID has forced us to, to work in different ways, basically. Um, because, well, I think you can sum up the entire presentation that I'm going to give here today um, simply by saying, well, it has sped up all the, let's say, more digital trends that have been affecting ports already um, even more. And um, basically the, the, the new way of working um, that has slowly been coming over the past few years um, has just basically be, been pushed upon us and we didn't really have the choice to, to, to learn to work in this new remote, more flexible manner. Um, some call it a good thing, some call it a bad thing. It's, it's kind of depending on your point of view, of course. Um, we're just gonna go today quickly through basically how COVID has affected the ports exactly and, and um, well, a little bit on their, their volume and such, but also on, on how it has affected the way of working of ports. And then um, touch upon a couple of technologies that have been used in the past and are currently being used more and more and more to kind of, let's say, build up the resilience of the port, build up the resilience on the way of working and um, kind of, well, allow the port to roll with punches. And I, I'm going to reuse a quote that I've, I've used before at uh, one of the, the Baltic Ports conferences, um, because it's very apt to the situation that we are in today. Um, namely that, that basically in order to, to be successful in a corona environment, in a crisis environment specifically, you have to be able to, to adapt. And uh, unfortunately, you have to be able to adapt in a very short time frame. Um, and well, the question of course remains, we had this crisis, it's still ongoing, it's kind of normalizing again. Will we need to, or are we going to fall back on what we had before the crisis? Or is it going to remain as is and are we going to say, let's say, go into the future of working and remain working from home and then remain pushing automation? So that's a bit of the question. And well, I mean, as a result of COVID-19, we've seen a drastic shift in, in, in the reality, right? I mean, I'm sitting here, you're sitting, I don't know, maybe in your office, maybe at home, uh, maybe in a coffee shop. Uh, remote working has become the norm. I'm still not allowed to go to the office in, in the Netherlands today as an example, or in London, in Belgium, we are allowed to go to the office, but it's a bit depending on, on the country and the situation. And what you see is that in, um, well, the majority of the companies, CEOs, CFOs are estimating that this kind of remains the normal going forward. I mean, people like the flexibility. To be honest, it's, it's way more fun to sit behind my computer and, and, and talk to you this way than to spend every morning in traffic to get to the office to, um, to, to, to do my work over there and, and maybe not necessary to, to kind of be in the office. So it, it allows a little bit of flexibility. And, and as so far as we can see today, a lot of people think that the trends that, that this, um, this crisis is setting in um, will be um, here to stay, basically. And I know in the past, we've always said like ports are a bit more traditional, a bit, a bit slower to adapt. They are crucial. Well, sometimes you have to be in a port to do work, right? It's very hard to unload a bag of, of a grain of a ship via your computer. I think in theory it should be possible, but you still need to have people inside. Um, but a lot of the, let's say, more back office types of functions um, are probably going to be more or less flexible over the coming years. So, I mean, a, a quick um, dive into how, how COVID has affected the ports. And I know it's it's also a topic of well, presentations before me and after me, so I'm not gonna uh, be too long on this. Um, but just to, to kind of uh, put the emphasis on, on how severe this impact has been. Um, well, this, this figure by um, Cambridge Economics and, and McKinsey um, just shows that uh, the, the crisis that we're having today 
is double the crisis that we had in 2008. And I remember in 2008 that everybody's like, oh, we're never going to recover from this. This is a disaster. China cut their export. It's, it's going to go wrong. Well, COVID has been or is currently multiple times worse. It's going to take longer to recover and it's going to have a way bigger impact on, um, on basically the, the base trading things, of course. And I mean, you can see it in the, the, the end of the curve. It is expected to recover by 2025 only, but overall, the impact is just ginormous. Of course, not on every commodity. It's mostly on, on autonomous, um, on, uh, sorry, not on autonomous. It's mostly on uh, automotive and transportation. Uh, and of course, the, the consumer goods, because consumer has been, been hit the hardest. So basically, your container business and your euro business. Um, of course, cruise is not in the, in the graph, because we know that cruise is um, almost as good as gone right now. Um, but it's very commodity dependent, right? So, so not every port is going to feel the impact as hard. And it, it's a classical thing that the more diversified you are as a port, the more you are able to balance out your, let's say, more stable commodities with your more unstable commodities. Um, but since it's containers that has been hit the hardest, um, we see that the vast majority of the ports um, are, let's say, struggling. And of course, for us today, it's not really about volume, because I mean, volume, although well, the, the core of the business model of ports um, is, is very important, the focus of today is on where the uh, technology can help us. And I have not seen a technology yet that allows you to, to bring more volume to your ports. Um, would be awesome if it existed, but it's probably for somewhere in the future. Um, but it's it's mostly about how the ports have been affected and how technology can um, help the ports to to kind of alleviate the um, let's say a drop or the, the stresses put by the crisis. And um, what we see in this is a dashboard of uh, IAPH, and I think Patrick is going to speak tomorrow, um, and you probably have way more insights on this dashboard than I do. Um, but just to give a quick overview, I mean we see that over 40% uh, of the ports, up to 70% in, in cruise, are still feeling the volume impact. So that's, of course, the one thing. But of, unfortunately, technology is not going to be able to help you there a lot, maybe a little bit. Um, but where it's more important and where technology can actually assist is on, um, let's say, the continuation of work, of course, on one end. So your shortage in your port workers and on the hinterland transport delay. So more the supply chain visibility, the supply chain automation, those types of things. And there we see that in the beginning of the crisis, and then we're talking about April, that's when they start with this dashboard, um, a very large percentage of the ports actually had um, issues uh, with, um, well, having a shortage of workers or having um, transport delays caused by, well, literally also a shortage of workers in your supply chain. Uh, mostly on the truck side, so over 43% of ports had issues with uh, transport delays caused probably by a, a shortage in workers. And then um, even up to, well, let's say 30%, so 28% in rail and in barge. Today, there is a, a very strong stabilization, right? So, I mean, in hinterland delays, only 9% of ports still, um, still register them um, across all modes. So it seems to be going in the right direction. Same in the shortage of workers. So even, well, mostly in the port authorities, uh, so basically the office buildings, right? So you're all working inside, you're all working together. Uh, in the beginning of the crisis, uh, a very large percentage of the port, up to 28%, and let's assume in March even more, had an issue with finding enough workers to do the work that had to be done. Um, dock workers a bit less, the nautical services also a bit less. I suppose, well, for two reasons. One, if your volume goes down, you need less dock workers, and if your volume goes down, you need less nautical service, right? Um, but your port authority, your back office keeps on running. And since you're in a crisis, you need more people. So that kind of makes sense on, on, on where the shortages um, have been in place. Today, once again, uh, we see that these have dropped drastically. So 5%, 4%, 2%. So you could say that there is a stabilization there. Um, and of course, it's very dependent on where you measure because um, this has been, um, well, it's an IPH dashboard. So it's all across the world. Um, I can imagine that if you're, for example, in South America right now, you have way bigger issues in finding enough people to be able to come into the office or come work on your terminal, come work in your port area, 
than um, in Europe, where we are kind of, let's say, stabilized and, and ready to put this entire thing behind us. Uh, but this, just as a recap, basically, what we're talking about today is, is the right hand side of the slide. So the transport delays and the shortage in port workers and how technology can be used to, to kind of build in resilience to, to uh, well, to be able to continue your, your basic services. Because it would have been very interesting to, to kind of just see if ports felt that they were unable to deliver their, um, their expected uh, value to the clients. That, that's something that's not in this, this dashboard, but would have been very interesting to kind of, to kind of see. And I hope it's maybe also discussed during the, the panel after this. Looking towards the trends, um, well, this is kind of an overview that we had right before COVID. We made it just before COVID on, on the kind of the trends that are affecting seaports. And um, due to COVID, we asked ourselves the question, so, so what happened? Are these trends still in place? And, and going forward, are technologies, are, are things happening to, to keep this going? And uh, what we found was that, well, most of the trends that we already identified are actually reinforced by the current situation that's happening. I mean, if you just think about it, protectionism, everybody's like, oh, we need to bring economy back to our own country. The till to Asia or from Asia in this case. So basically everything coming back from, from supply chains from Asia back to Europe is happening. The increased use of technology, what we're talking about literally today um, is, 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 well, strengthened out of proportion even. I mean, if, if you talk about automation, if you talked about automation uh, before the COVID crisis, people were still hesitant saying, well, it's going to affect job, it's going to be, um, well, it's, it's going to be a bad thing because it's going to decrease the value that I'm delivering as a port to the community. Today, people are saying, well, if we have automation in place, it's, it's only for the better because I have a buffer against uncertainty, against people being able to come into work. The focus on niche markets is going up. Um, the new product chains are going up. Of course, sustainability is probably pushed back a bit, unfortunately. Um, we see indications that it's a bit depending on the country, but to be honest, the, the focus of investments is shifting a bit to, to, to well, economy boosting and economy re regeneration. And new trade routes are also being investigated, basically shortening the supply chain and doing more nearshoring in line with your, your protections. Um, so in summary, COVID has affected the ports enormously, but has mostly strengthened the trends that we already saw. So, so basically everything that we said was going to happen is happening only faster. And I'm really looking forward to the panel after this to see if, if they agree with this, that basically where there was a bit of hesitance in the past on the added value of the technologies, what we see today um, that basically the, the, well, the, the, um, the barrier to, to kind of adopt them is, is slowly decreasing. So, I mean, to summarize that part, what happened? Well, it was kind of a perfect storm, right? You had your supply chain disruption on the one hand with what we saw, um, having not enough people to drive your trucks and your trains. You had a demand disruption on the other end. So people don't buy anymore. They're, they're not able to go outside, so they don't buy anymore. And you have a trans sorry, supply disruption on the end of China where the factories are closed down and you have a transport disruption on the end of, of the trucks and the trains that are... Um, not able to do their job anymore. So for ports, it was kind of the perfect storm. The supply, demand, and the transport between the two was basically in complete shutdown. And, and that had a humongous effect on uh, the direct short-term revenue, basically the revenue of, of ships coming in and cargo being loaded and unloaded. On the long-term revenue, you still don't know that effect, but well, I mean, if, if um, terminal companies are, or transport companies are not able to pay the bills anymore, then they are also not able to pay the land leases anymore. Your costs are going up because you need to invest in work at home infrastructure, in laptops for your employees, in uh, more flexibility, hiring new people, uh, doing uh, more safety checks. So costs are going up on the other end. And you have a pressure on the continuity of services um, with people not being able to work anymore or not being able to come into work anymore. So uh, the impact has and is still, still huge. Although what we saw is that most ports, ports authorities then feel that it's manageable and they're not gonna go bankrupt tomorrow. But still it's, it has been a very large, um, let's say a reshuffling in the reality 
of what it is to be a port authority and what it is to, to be successful as a port authority. Now, towards the future, do we expect this to, to kind of continue? And, and this is just a quick intro on, on what we as Deloitte think is going to happen. Um, and we have four scenarios, basically uh, passing storm, the long wolves, which you really don't want, a good company and a sunrise in the east. What we're seeing today is um, that you're going more towards um, a passing storm in a good company, at least in Europe. Um, this is not the case in South America where, um, or in Africa, where it's probably going to be way worse. Um, but in, in Europe, the impact will probably be manageable. And what you see is that mostly smaller companies will be hit and uh, the kind of larger companies are, um, well, uh, let's say, uh, weeping the benefits and that's something that you see very very strongly today of course that your amazons of this world your alibabas of this world are strongly benefiting of this crisis just because they have the internal resilience they have the technologies in place they have the automation they have um, well everything there to kind of roll with the punches and, and and become better and stronger out of this crisis Heading towards the automation. So what do you see is basically that a lot of companies can use and are using this as, as, as a way to, to kind of, um, well, benefit from it. Um, if we think about automation, as I said, pre-COVID, it was, well, automation is, is job loss, right? Automation is, 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 is just um, waiting for the union to knock at my door and, and tell me that I'm, that I'm uh, taking too many, too many jobs away. What we see today is that, well, more and more companies, and then we're talking both terminal or, well, not really port authorities, but are seeing the benefit of at least having some type of autonomy, reducing the impact that, that or the, the dependency on the human elements. Second, flexibility of labor. Um, in the past, it was, well, you need to be on site to deliver work. We're talking now. So what we've seen is that, well, flexibility is is kind of well fun and, and easy to do if you have a decent laptop and no kids running around or anything uh remote working well yeah it's working right we're, we're talking to each other uh ecosystems and, and collaboration so so in the past it was very typical that people thought well you need to be in a room and i would much rather be in a room with you guys so for something like this a conference i do get that people are still a bit hesitant but in theory quick decision making um and connections are also possible the way we're doing it now and then finally focus on health and inclusiveness so so basically the traditional view that health was monitored in the workspace um is also slowly shifting towards well uh that health and well-being is kind of more a way of life a way of work rather than just something that needs to be monitored by um maybe your manager or your leader at the office so overall you see a very big shift minds shift towards um more the uh, uh let's say the more flexible type of, uh, of thinking working you've all seen this slide a lot i think about technologies used in ports to summarize them there are two ones that we're going to discuss today one that increases visibility flexibility and control across your supply chain the other one that increases automation and reduces dependency on the human element that's basically if you want to summarize what what technology does for your port the two main things and a bit of a deep dive on each of those two um, reducing the dependency on the human elements. Example from the port of Antwerp, well, a smart harbor master system. Cameras, which are actually also programmed by people, so you still need people in this entire uh, exercise, but cameras that are able to identify ships within, I think, even half a meter or something, and um, are uh, keeping smart track of where every ship in your port is that you, in theory, don't need a harbor master anymore. Um, very handy if you have a shortage of 20% of your technical nautical staff, right? Your cameras are basically your technical nautical staff. Second one, uh, while cargo and port community systems, even though not directly helping ports in, um, well, alleviating the direct results of the crisis, they are there and becoming more important and becoming more at the center of business models of ports uh, towards the future and allowing you to, to kind of uh, manage everything from behind your computer, literally. You're, you're, you have a control center, you have a port community system that's kind of a control center that allows you to, to manage everything. And I put three up there. There are hundreds of examples. We, we recently mapped all of them 
that are in existence. Um, so there are a lot of initiatives there that all deliver value somehow to the ports. But what you see is that, well, the logic to have these types of systems, the, the value to have these types of systems um, has uh, become very apparent thanks to the crisis. Then, of course, thermal automation. I mean, once again, reducing the, the dependency on um, having somebody actually load and unload your ship. This is, of course, not possible for every type of cargo. Um, it's never going to be possible to have a fully automated, let's say, general cargo loader, uh, loader unload, because you always need to do the, the, the tying the ropes and the tying the knots and making sure that everything is, is secure in place. But reducing the dependency on people is uh, something that everyday ports are more and more thinking about. And once again, COVID has given that mindset shift to the usefulness and kind of the benefit against not being able to perform your services anymore. And finally, remote working, well, shouldn't come as a, as a surprise, right? Um, we're doing this, we're doing this with Zoom today. Uh, the remote working is not only video calling, but also maybe not going for full automation, right? So this is a crane operator um, operating, I think it's in Rotterdam also, but operating the, um, the cranes remotely, that's also something that can kind of take the stress away from, from having uh, people that are not able to come into work anymore. So, so that type of technology. So, I mean, to summarize everything, COVID has had a very, very large and significant impact on the way we, we work. Um, trade volumes will probably recover, but it's going to take time. But the entire crisis has hit the ports at what they do, both supply, demand, and transport. There's been a systematic shutdown, basically, of, of everything that has happened. And this has led to the speeding up of a lot of the, the traditional trends that we already saw. So, um, I mean, it's, it's not that it changed everything, it's that it just pushed everything along way faster. Um, and, and in line with this, the perception of the usefulness of smart ports has shifted. I mean, it's nothing new that I've told you here today, just that people see the value in a different way. And the technologies that has, have been used and are going to be used in the future ever more often to, to alleviate things like this, well, they're already there. I mean, port automation is already there. Remote working is already there. Your port community systems are already there. They're just gonna be used more and more and more and in different ways. So, I mean, if you summarize them, like I said, automation and, and basically increasing the, the supply chain ecosystem visibility and flexibility, but it all comes down to basically three things. Maybe a, being able to do it remotely, so being able to not do it on site, reducing your dependency on the human element, and working in a smarter way, by which I mean like your port community systems, being more flexible, being more visible, and just being able to plan it, literally plan it from behind your laptop. So, I mean, like I said, it's nothing new. It's just that it's happening more and more and more, faster and faster and faster. And the crisis has kind of woken us up to the value that the, the different technologies that are already often there have for um, our ports. That's it from my end. So, so I hope that the panel after this will, will agree. And if not, well, then I'll, I'll give another presentation next time, completely saying the opposite. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Indra. An insight-packed presentation for us to further unwrap. Thank you very much. So this is a good segue to our second panel debate of today, in which we are going to try to answer the question, is being tech savvy is what really cuts the edge today? Please let me introduce the Panelists, we've got the Port of Oslo's Chief Executive Ingvar Mathiesen, Port of Hamburg's Ingrid Bouquet Sastre, Officer Global Strategic Networks, Port of Rotterdam's Raoul Tan, Senior Manager Digital Business Solutions, the Port of Tallinn Chief Commercial Officer in the person of Marcus Wichmann, and the Port of Valencia's Juan Manuela Diaz, Head of Strategic Planning and Innovation. Welcome. Can we have you on screen? Mm -hmm. 
Great to see you. Now, let us kick off the discussion maybe with uh, Ingvar. Ingvar, you made an ambitious statement to become the world's first emission-free port with 2030 set as the deadline. What are the tools with which this goal will be hit on the head and what's the current progress stage? Thank you uh, very much for um, having me attend. I'm also very pleased that uh, we are one of the two uh, friendship ports of PPO. Uh, my, uh, my focus actually will be uh, now on the overall uh, perspective as stated in the title of this uh, webinar, adapted to change the new reality of the port sector. And uh, to take your question in a roundabout way, uh, my uh, objective now is to uh, avoid having this temporary setback in the long term, temporary setback of the COVID-19 pandemic, and not uh, to interfere with uh, the goals that we have to be, uh, become one of the world's first uh, zero emission ports. Uh, because uh, this is indeed a, a monumental task where indeed uh, also digital tools and solutions play an in, um, instrumental role. Uh, so what I could um, um, say is that we have, um, first of all, we have this um, um, zero emission plan where we have uh, 17 measures identified, uh, 17 actions to cut the, the greenhouse gases, but not only that, but also the SOX, the NOX, the particle matters. And that is very uh, well uh, identified, not only for the port itself, but uh, the port's share of the total uh, municipalities uh, uh, um, uh, pollution, basically. Uh, and uh, furthermore, uh, uh, this was derived by close co uh, collaboration between the city of Oslo, port of Oslo, uh, and then, of course, the customers, technology providers, and so on. Uh, because in order to cut emissions, we have to uh, do the right way. We have to cut uh, emissions where it's the least uh, cost and highest benefits. And then, then we need to know what those are. So this um, zero emission plan have identified, in addition to 17 measures to cut um, the emissions, have also uh, what is the emission sailing into port, the last uh, nautical mile, uh, maneuvering to the key sides, uh, the land activity to and from the ship while uh, alongside, uh, and uh, done that also for all the, the segments we have in the port, international ferries, the container vessels, the bulk, the wet bulk, and so on. And when you have that, then you can start uh, looking at uh, um, how to uh, do the uh, walk, not only do the talk, because uh, as you say, the the ambitions is very fine and dandy if you don't have to deliver, but we have to indeed deliver. And that's why this, uh, this uh, setback of the COVID-19 cannot interfere with that in the long term. So in that sense, uh, we, are, um, we have a um, conceptual uh, appraisal um, that have been uh, completed. Uh, and this appraisal that ended up in our end report of 190 uh, pages, the core report, and then uh, with uh, numerous attachments detailing a lot of those uh, particular areas and technology uh, uh, achievements had to be uh, conducted in order to, to cut uh, the emissions. But um, first and foremost, we have to, uh, have to define the framework of the project. And the framework, the number one was all sectors have to cut emissions, also the uh, maritime sector. Uh, the aim is to for Port of Oslo to cut the green uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 85 percent within 2030, and uh, down to zero in 2050. At the same time, we also have to incorporate the task that we uh, the strategic goal is to grow the cargo throughput of the uh, port in the same period by 50 percent. So here we have our like our, our uh, Gordic uh, knot. We have to uh, cut emissions, and we have to increase the volume by significant numbers. So when that was done, the framework of the, the study, then uh, we also have to uh, conduct a mapping on the existing demands of the energy. 
what equipment uh, is in the port, what do they use, ship, trucks, reach stackers, and so on. Uh, and also what processes are occurring. How far are the ship trucks traveling during operations, their fuel consumption, et cetera, et cetera. And we had also identified the current electricity infrastructure, uh, including um, existing net topology, uh, the size of the main cable uh, at the port, uh, and uh, the positioning, number, and size of uh, transformer, and, uh, and so on. And, and the furthermore, the heat demand had to be uh, established, the current heat demand for building cement storage and concrete production, etc. When that was done, we had to focus uh, on, or the study focused on how to reduce the energy demand. Uh, and also reduce uh, container crane lifts by smart stacking with regards to unloading ships and uh, loading of trucks. Uh, also reduce energy demand of buildings, more efficient machines, smart lighting programs and better insulation. And then also we establish in, in over part of the, the world, uh, the heat pump reduce electricity demand by 70%. So when that was done, the next step in the study was then to uh, look into the future energy demand. And then, um, then the goal would be the mobility, the fossil fuel based, there should be none of that in the future. The mo uh, mobility is zero emission, then we have to look into hydrogen, ammonia, and hybrid solution uh, in addition to electrical solutions. And then we have to look at the infrastructure for the electricity grid and uh, installations. But because we have to have shore power for ships, charging of ships, electrification of trucks and reach trackers and buildings and et cetera. And only then we can start looking at the future energy system where we will have our, um, both the close view and a long-term view. So the short term is uh, zero to five years, the long term is uh, plus five years. So that is uh, basically how we organized uh, that uh, job. And now we re really had to get into the details and start making this happen because obviously Port of Oslo's emissions as uh, our own organization is minuscule. Uh, our customers is basically the one who provides this. So we had to make sure they are on board and we have to uh, apply the right amount of uh, carrot and uh, the right amount of stick to make this happen. So I think I leave it at this uh, for, for the time being, and I can go back to concrete examples what we have done with implementing uh, uh, smart technology. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Now, Ingrid, how is the work going on turning Hamburg into a smart port? Specifically, what's the progress on putting technology to environmental use, including testing 5G or going down the e-mobility lane? Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. First, I want to express my appreciation um, to the Baltic Ports Organization for hosting this today's webinar. I mean, which is a very good example, um, uh, right? How the way of working has changed radically in just a few months. Um, yeah, towards advanced digital uh, manner. So thank you, in particular, for considering us um, for this panel discussion. Um, and in regard to your question, Chemek, here um, Hamburg has been well positioned for years and was well prepared uh, for the crisis. Um, we have never stopped researching for innovations. One example, despite the crisis, the Hamburg Port Authority has continued um, to work on, on the topic of drones. And in this regard, we have an ongoing project. Um, this is called Port Wings. And it's based in the use of drones, especially tailored to the needs um, of maritime facilities and individually designed for use in the port of Hamburg. So these drones can operate under heavy condition, under heavy weather conditions, so heavy, um, rainy and strong winds. So this project is evaluating how I'm an aerial vehicle, um, drones can support HPA in two essential tasks within the ports. Um, floods, accidents, or other unexpected um, incidents occur. Drones are on site much faster than road vehicles um, or port barges when it comes to video and photo material for a precise picture of the situation. So all the important information can be forwarded digitally and directly to the right people so that the appropriate measures 
um, can be taken. So this saving um, in time can make um, a big difference um, in an emergency. So at the same time, these drones um, make the maintenance expansion of the ports infrastructure for sure much more efficient. Um, this goes um, for both inspection of buildings and facilities, as well as for supporting processes and monitoring facilities, which are difficult to reach or are only accessible under dangerous conditions. So besides, um, we are currently planning further research projects in which productive 5G technology um, will be used in the port. In particular, these projects are intended um, to advance the integration of floating and flying um, drones over 5G into the processes of, of the HPA. So we see 5G as the communication standard of the future. It offers security, reliability, and the all of which did not exist in mobile networks um, before. So it opens completely new fields of application and not only does um, the port profit from it, but also the whole, the whole city. Um, so in the port of Hamburg, we believe that the use um, of 5G network slices will facilitate the optimization uh, of port and city processes focused on logistical applications concerning traffic and, and infrastructure control. Um, also regarding um, the e-mobility lane. So electric vehicles are becoming more present in road transport. So we are also reviewing ways, uh, ways of extending e-mobility to passenger and freight traffic in the harbor area. And, and there is an important point to, to, take, into, to take into account. Um, account. The port of Hamburg is located in the city center, right? And therefore, not only climate protection, but, the same, but especially um, the reduction of air pollution and emissions play a crucial role um, in public discussions. Um, so in this regard, um, the Hamburg fleet, for example, which is a subsidiary um, company of the HPA, uh, which contains about 50 ships, mostly harbor ships with different functions, firefighting boats, police ships, and so on. So, so it's an innovation driver in terms of sustainability for other public um, companies and private ship operators in the port. Since in the near future, um, the fleet of Hamburg will be electrified. In a spring 2021, already two five fighting boats uh, will be operating with ivory drive. And in addition, there are initial plans for a fully electric um, ship for the port of Hamburg. And another example, example is currently in the HPA, 33% um, of the passenger car fleet are electric vehicles. And the rest of the fleet operated by, by the HPA is gradually being replaced by um, electric ones. And, and also this year, electric bicycles have also been purchased for the HP staff to be able to ride short distances. Um, so these are now being tested and it's planned to be to expand the e-bike fleet um, soon. And for sure, also our partner, um, the container terminal operator, HHLA, has been working on a project to introduce driveless bicycle to the port of Hamburg. So they are testing right now um, in the HHLA um, container terminal Altenberda, CTA, and automatic and self-driving trucks in real life scenarios. Um, this project is called um, Hamburg Truck Pilot. And um, yeah, initially will involve two prototype trucks um, that in fully automated and autonomous operation will unload and reload at the terminal CTA. Um, so in future, automated driving functionalities will both support truck drivers in their work. Uh, for example, during the autonomous loading and reloading at the terminal, they could leave the vehicle and use the time for mandatory breaks. Um, so the, this concept significantly reduces fuel consumption and can positively influence the general um, flow at, at traffic as well as increase in overall um, safety. And just to conclude, I mean, next year in, in Hamburg at the ITS, 
World Congress uh, will be presented more than 50 ongoing projects focused among others on um, autonomous and connected driving, sustainable transport and intelligent infrastructure. So we did it during these uncertain times and we will we'll keep turning Hamburg um, into a smart board. Great, thank you very much. Love the practical uh, examples. Nice, you are walking the walk, it seems. <laughs> Thanks, Now, Raul, there's an eye-catching headline on your website in the Doing Business section that reads, why innovate in Rotterdam? As such, why? Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, a warm welcome from, uh, from the Rotterdam to everyone joining today, but also to my uh, uh, peer uh, panelist uh, of today. Uh, yeah, well, that, that's a great question indeed. Why innovate in Rotterdam? And first of all, Rotterdam is a great place to live, work, but also to innovate. And I think uh, first and foremost, because we as Port of Rotterdam are strong believers that innovation is vital for sustainable port modes. And as such, uh, successful innovation is all about collaboration and co-creation. That's exactly the reason why we focus on um, an innovation ecosystem, which connects all parties uh, which are required to successfully innovate. And you could think about uh, scientific and research institutes, uh, but also uh, maritime uh, startup incubators. So for example, we founded uh, a Port Excel, uh, which is connecting um, new startups to large networks and corporations. Um, but we also invite our network, uh, parties from our port commu community, and we connect with governing bodies as well. So to give a few examples, for example, we founded a, a block lab, which is a, a lab for blockchain-based solutions centralized around, uh, on the one hand, energy transition, and on the other hand, logistics. Um, and we have several other uh, ventures as well. And in our vision, uh, it far outreaches Rotterdam, to be fairly honest, because as stated, we designed and built an innovation ecosystem here in the port of Rotterdam. But where we truly believe in is um, where the real values to be grasped and to be captured for all of us is it's about connectivity. It's about connecting one port and in port innovation ecosystem to another ecosystem, to another ecosystem, eventually evolving into an, an ecosystem of ecosystems, so to say, in which everyone in our global supply chain will be connected one way or the other and on numerous levels. So I think that is one of the, uh, the main reasons um, why we heavily invest in innovation, why we facilitate innovation, why one of them is a great place to innovate. Uh, I think this was also show, showcased in the uh, presentation by uh, Indra of Deloitte earlier, uh, where Port of Rotterdam was uh, in, in numerous leading examples in this presentation. And I think, um, <laughs> nevertheless, as, not, not only is Rotterdam as such a gateway to, to innovation, uh, but it will also allow private and public companies to really uh, leapfrog into the possibilities of the world of tomorrow. And, um, and on a final note, as you stated that it was in the section on our website, uh, uh, in the doing business section. So the Rotterdam style is to put your money where your mouth is. So therefore, I would like to, to reach out to, uh, to everybody who's, who's joined in today. Um, whether you are a port or whether you're a, a, a shipper, if a reliable ETA of any incoming vessel would be of added value to you, um, we, will, we would be able to offer you a, a free trial of a ETA service for you to experience firsthand of what is the added value within your port, within your port community, or for your, uh, for your company as well. So um, I think we should all uh, support each other, especially during these times. So this is uh, something we, I wanted to reach out uh, to all of you today. 
and um, let's discuss after the webinar, but just wanted to, uh, to post the option. Thank you very much for your thoughts. Now, uh, Margus, are you with us? Can you see you? Yes, I am. Hello, Hello, everybody. A quote for you. Port of Tannin become the most innovative port on the shores of the Baltic Sea. Read your web page, which is by all means a bold statement. However, let's start not the, with the port itself, but its role in the wider supply chain to be streamlined in Estonia with the use of the data exchange single window and logistics x road systems. It sounds good on the paper, but does it deliver value at the end of the day? And for all parties involved, ports, terminals, uh, governmental agencies, forwarders, shipping clients, shippers, etc. After all, while everyone admits that data are pivotal in modern logistics, companies tend to treat them as family silverware, tightly kept away from third parties. What's your take on that? Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers and, and compliment you on the, on the fine webinar that you, that you are organizing. Uh, answering your question, uh, first of all, the, the vision is actually a little bit longer, and, uh, and, uh, we, which we have on our website. And, and it actually says that the, we, we aim to become the most innovative port on the Baltic Seas by offering its customers the best environment and development opportunities. So we, we have a very you know, specific goal to, to, uh, to do it all for the, for the customers and, and trying to uh, maybe find the competitive advantage um, uh, through, through that. Uh, secondly, coming, coming back to your, um, your question about the, the, is it bringing any value, the, the innovations that we have, then uh, I would say definitely yes. And, uh, and we see these uh, things even more uh, during these, these difficult uh, coronavirus uh, times. Uh, for example, uh, some of you might know the, the uh, smart port system that we, we have been developing through a few years ago, and, and uh, I've been actually presenting it uh, in spring in, uh, in Riga, uh, which was probably the, one of the last conferences uh, which was physically held. Uh, and, uh, and, um, and uh, you, you might uh, remember that, that there is a, uh, it, originally it was developed to, to um, fastly move the, the vehicles and, uh, and the travelers uh, through the port. Uh, now, during the coronavirus, there is um, uh, one very big advantage um, uh, that, that we have seen also that if you are traveling by car and you are using the self-check-in on the web, uh, then um, you don't have to interact with any personnel of the um, uh, port uh, and uh, to, to get into the into the ship uh, or, or on the board of the ship, which basically means that you are in the safety of your car and there is no way that you can uh, uh, catch the virus there. Um, now, if, if you, we are, if we're talking about this um, uh, this paperless um, uh, logistics and uh, and uh, and moving the the uh, paper, paper documents in in the in the web. And this, of course, uh, is is doing the same thing for the for the coronavirus. So you you have less contacts with with real persons. Uh, plus, of course, there is uh, advantage of time. Uh, unfortunately, you know there is there are some logistic partners that are. Uh, you know more advanced or or uh, doing the innovations quicker, and then there are. Let's say um, yeah, companies or, or even industries that are um, more conservative. So, um, uh, and, and I would say that one of the very conservative industries is the railway. Uh, I don't know why, but but uh, maybe, maybe because of the history. Uh, and uh, and um, in in Estonia, we we have a problem that if if everybody else is is uh, working together with uh, with these paperless solutions. Um, then the, the biggest uh, uh, you know, slowdown or, or, or the, the brakes are, are in the hands of, uh, of railway. So, so uh, and, and uh, again, if we look at the port side, then the railway is, is a very important part. Uh, basically the only way that you can bring large quantities of, of goods into the port. Uh, so so um, um, in, in, that, in that sense, yes, 
definitely there is uh, there is advantages uh, even if we look at the nowadays uh, uh, situation uh, but uh, uh, you know the, the the real advantages will open then when everybody is connected into the network and uh, is is giving their part uh, and this is this is also not only inside the you know the one country but uh, the, the real advantage would be if you can uh, also attach uh, you know, your neighbors or, or the trade partners let's say the goods coming from russia already digitally uh, custom clearance is, is done and everything all the paperwork is done and and uh, and then the train or or on the truck is is physically going very fast over the border great thank you very much for that now during this webinar we are also putting the spotlight on the south of europe now turning our attention to Spain's East Coast. Juan Manuel, not so long ago, Valencia Port presented its innovation plan, pinpointing over 40 areas that can be improved by putting to good use modern solutions, especially those concerned with decarbonizing and digitalizing port and port related activities. What's in Valencia's toolbox that will bring the port onto the next level environment and operation wise? Good morning. <clears throat> First of all, thank you. I want to thank the uh, Baltic Port Organization for giving us this opportunity for sharing in uh, our our um, our experience in this quite interesting uh, panel, as you say. And well, many of the, the the ideas that I will evoke probably have been already. Uh, or look it here this, this morning. Uh, well, talking about our our uh, innovation plan, I, first first of all, I will say, it's not uh, the port authority innovation plan. It's the port community, the port cluster innovation plan, because uh, we really believe that even as a port authority, we have to lead the port community. We need all the people, all the companies inside this uh, this plan to have really a re-transformational uh, roadmap. So we are counting on uh, terminals, freight forwarders, shipping agencies, uh, different institutions. We wanted to put all them together. And in fact, the, the, the plan was developed with their help. We asked people, we, we had several meetings with different different actors, uh, so that we've got this, this high let's say high, quite exhaustive with 40, yes, 40 areas, well, not big areas, but we, we try to, to be exhaustive in, in what we, we have to deal as, as a poor community. Okay. Uh, fortunately, we can uh, come with this, for this, uh, with the Fundación Valencia Port, which is our sister company, which itself is also a, a result of the poor community because in the, in a, it's a board of directors, you have, you can found uh, terminals, you can found institutions, the power authority, of course, but with the help of, of, the, of the foundation, we, we managed to build this, this I, I love to talk about it as a roadmap, because at the end of the day, it's it what it is, okay? And yes, we wanted to focus in two main challenges that I think all, all ports are facing and that all, it's been mentioned already this morning. Digitalization and um, decarbonization. Okay. In fact, we, we as a port in Valencia, we have set the goal of being carbon neutral by 2030, which is far ahead of the general objectives for, for, for this period. And uh, for this uh, ambitious uh, goal, we need to, to be able to mobilize all the talent that we can inside our port community and our port cluster, but also trying to attract new ideas from outside. Okay, we want to, to create, as, uh, as our colleague for Rotterman said, we, a real innovation ecosystem. And for this, we have to open, you know, we, we in ports, we are used to be very quite, quite close business inside our communities. We know each other well, but we are not, to host, to, to, we're not used to, to open the window, to open the door to other actors. And we, we want to do that. And uh, we are trying to use different tools. For example, we, we, we have set with the climate kick uh, support from the European Union, the super lab ports, which is a space for entrepreneurship and for innovation for startups. 
where they can, uh, of course, take advantage of the facilities, but also of the possibility of uh, encountering other startups focused in climate change um, uh, issues concerning the maritime and the port industry. Also, we are with the, with the rest of the Spanish port and we are leading because we push for that to, to become a reality. We are, we are launching the Ports 4.0 uh, initiative, which is a global initiative for the Spanish port system, uh, which tries to bring again, open innovation inside the ports in Spain uh, with a first uh, call of proposal with 20 million euros of grants for ideas and projects to be developed in the main areas of, of uh, port management that, that are uh, key in this moment, like again, the digitalization, environmental sustainability, safety, security, uh, efficiency, logistic change in the integration. Okay. Uh, with this uh, initiative, again, we want to use our, our um, innovation plan for the cluster as a roadmap integrated all these initiatives in order to be focused at the same time. Okay. We have clear, we have decided, we have identified our needs and that we, we have to make steps to be covering all these possible uh, opportunities. And uh, well, we are so far not, not, not uh, let's say, uh, too, um, too pretentious, but uh, we are happy because we are, we are getting step-by-step uh, step different goals. And for example, we, we have uh, had the, in the last uh, sustainability awards of the IAPH, we have uh, two projects uh, launched in, uh, in Valencia Port, coordinated by the Valencia Port, that have been awarded. One of them is the Green Sea uh, Ports, which try to combine digitalization, big data, uh, machine learning for the environmental uh, survey of the port area. For example, using cameras uh, for identifying pollution coming from ships. Okay. And uh, the other, we have also the Loopport project, which is a project dedicated to investigate and to, to uh, look for examples to good practices for circular economy within the port. Again, within the port community, uh, involving different actors in the port. And uh, well, and also I want to evoke, because we are today talking about the crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, how this has affected our plans. Well, uh, we see uh, this crisis and, as an opportunity and for accelerating this transformational change. We really believe that the world, the aftermath of the crisis, the, crisis, the recovery will be somehow a green recovery. So again, decarbonization and environmental sustainability, sustainability will be of paramount importance. Also, we have realized, and maybe we can talk about that later, uh, the importance it has, mentioned, has been mentioned already of resilience. And innovation will be key for resilience of uh, logistics chains using ports. So we have to work again to foster digitalization and to foster innovation, to have more tools, to be more resilient and to be prepared for, let's hope it won't be soon again, a new crisis and of course for, for the, as I mentioned, the aftermath of, of this crisis. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I must say that the prevailing perception of the port industry has been or maybe was that it's conservative, inert and not willing to blaze the trail. But your examples show that the port industry is really embracing the digital revolution and ports in Europe are becoming adventurous, open to new technologies and in technological terms, plainly geeky in that positive, enthusiastic sense of adapting new technologies to hit various goals on the uh, head. Thank you very much for participating in this uh, panel debate. A lot of food for thought.
thought and please stay with us for the final presentation. A big round of applause for our great debating debaters. Thank you very, thank you very so much. Thank you. Now, we are closing day one with everybody's favorite, Greek Connects Dan Stainus, who will deliver a presentation showcasing how technology can bridge port and shipping operations for greater efficiency of both. Dan, are you with us? I can see you. The floor. Still the here, still here. Floor. It's been a good day. Let me uh, share my screen and see how this, this one works. Give me a shout out if you see my presentation. Yes, we can see it. Full screen. Okay. Hunky Dory. Hey, Please brilliant. Proceed. All right. Hey, and thanks for the great intro. I'm not sure I'm deserving of that, but, uh, but anyway, and thanks to Bogdan and the team for uh, having me here, but also for arranging this webinar and making it accessible to everyone. I think that's quite impressive. Now this is, it's a bit different than standing on stage in Stockholm talking to you guys, but uh, this is good as, ve as well. So a virtual hello from me and from the guys at Grid Connect to all of you guys. It's great that you're here. My name is Dan. I function as the business development manager in the Baltic Sea region for Grid Connect. I live in Tampere in Finland, trying to raise two girls here while doing work. All this one started school, Amanda, two weeks ago, and it's exciting times for my family. And it's uh, interesting times at work as well. So today I thought I'd, I'd, I'd talk a little bit about our thoughts at Grid Connect on uh, on the future and then uh, it's exciting to hear feedback from you guys afterwards then so so headline here is self-service and let's see where uh, where this ride takes us a few things about uh, my employer 32 people strong delivering port management systems terminal operating system systems for management of ferries and also port call management data. Quite a lot of cooperation partners around in the Nordics, but as you see, we'd love to have a few more of them in the Baltic Sea region, and I hope that that's gonna be the case in, uh, in some time. Today's topic on my behalf is self-service, and I put that under an umbrella so what I wanted to do was first to uh, kind of define it for myself. So I put a simple one on it. It's just serving yourself when you do a, when you're in a purchase situation or you're searching for information in any kind. And then a self-service application would then be something which would replace a manual process or something below that umbrella. And why do I think that self-service is important? I started to think about it in terms of how we people as individual single entities set up systems for making sense of our world. Now, if you move that towards a collective entity of people working at a firm, in or in a network of firms working together to provide some sort of service and reach some sort of end goal, whatever it is, then I have this idea that processes, they become more and more complex. There becomes more chains, linkages in the process, more stakeholders. And on this part, I just wanted to leave you with like the thought to ponder upon that when you have that amount of stakeholders what what are their goal in such a process is it to provide that great customer experience giving you guys revenue or could it just to be to keep the equilibrium going so so that's one that that's one to think about i wanted to put self-service in in a context and 
I think in addition to airline industry, I think banking is a great one. You know, years ago, you would actually go with all of your daily business to a clerk who would handle it for you. Nowadays, I can handle any invoice, anything on my phone, just when I want it, at the speed I want it, just when it's suitable for me. And that feels, that feels empowering, guys. And it's the same on a, on a, on a Friday afternoon, as I wrote on, uh, on, on LinkedIn last week. You know, when, you're, when you go to your hypermarket, you buy your steak, salad, candy, beers, whatever you would need on a, for a weekend. And you arrive at the, um, at the uh, checkout and you find yourself number eight in line to pay. It, it, it's not a nice thing, you know. So these, uh, these really nice self-service checkouts, which has appeared on stores around in Finland, make sure that you at least get out of the store and home to your family to celebrate that it's weekend a bit faster. And, uh, and I think that this thing, you know, it's, it, it's, it's the world we live in and the way we consume information. I mean, we got Netflix, we got news 24 seven, we got Twitter, phones beeping all around us. And we get used to more frequent interactions. And I, I, I wrote need for speed here, but I think that it's the same in processes also in B2B, or at least is coming. The fact that you should be served on your own uh, terms when you want it. So these two things are the, uh, the external factors. And the internal one is, I think, is quite obvious for everyone. When you have a well-functioning self-service process, this streamlines your operations as well. Now, getting to the matter at hand, trying to show a bit on it, mock-ups and, uh, and info on this, I think that we in Grid Connect we could help you guys with four areas. I think that the technology or the software side of it is quite ready. There are on the hardware side for certain things, there is standardizations needed to be done to enable you know, an integrated self-service experience for your, uh, for your customers. But I think we're getting there and we should be pushing these things. So what I'm going to do within the 10 minutes I'm allocated is that I'm going to just show you a few images, get your minds to think about this. And I'm happy to have a longer discussion about this one afterwards then. But if you start with Keyside booking a real-time change request, what is the foundation you need for this one? I think it is, or it is a smart port call data algorithm or program to uh, ensure that you know the real-time arrival of a vessel. And when I say real-time arrival of a vessel, I mean then just at that second, when is it going to arrive? Keeping in mind varieties like change of speed, historic behavior for given given vessel types, routes they're taking, weather. So that's important. And then you obviously have ship to shore communication, enabling this kind of real time, uh, real time change request. If you should be late, for example, or too early. Event management is important. So basically, when did the ship arrive to your port? And when did the ship depart from your port? It's something we've been doing for quite a long time. And this, are, this data together, they're, they're important if you guys want to become data-driven in the future. And ideally, when you have this and you have a communication in place and it's smartness, you should also be able to share it with your customers or your cooperation partner on land, whether it's the operator or some other client working within your, uh, within your uh, port area, truck driver, etc. So what we have done in Grid Connect, we've made a mobile application to streamline work at ports. 
And this application we've been rolling out to Norwegian ports now and to those interested starting this spring. And the idea first is that these things are going to be used to simplify processes at port. You're going to be able to perform actions via your mobile. But the next step, and we're doing mock-ups and preparing for this, is that we're going to disclose, or the idea is that if the port wants to, you can take your port management system, twist it inside out, and disclose certain areas. So for example, your key side occupancy. Now, if you disclose that into an application used by your customers, then it's a short way for them to book in real time or request a key from a given uh, period to another period, and then also use the system to make real time change requests. So that's one of the ideas that we have to empower customers. The system the customers are gonna use looks like this on the, on the desktop. But here's the key planner. Here is the different services, which I'm gonna jump into shortly and also operations. So if you look at the services, I wanted to just mention to you the filling of water and the consumption of short power. So our idea is that using this app, we have technology in place allowing a vessel to start a short power facility, consuming electricity at a given rate, disclosing it on the phone, making that person attentive of what is used. And we also have a control center for the shore power for the port itself to see. This function at the same way for a uh, fre filling of fresh water, for example, so we're going to enable this autumn for fresh water, some instrumentation on the hardware side, and then on the software side, a similar process allowing for self-service for ships who wants this. And if you remember back, that, that means streamlined internal processes, empowering our customers, need for speed, they can do it at just the time they would like to do it. Now, I'm sure a lot of you guys are thinking about the hardware side. And it's true that the, on, the, on water filling, it's quite OK, actually. But it needs to become more standardized on shore power to enable that integrated experience for, for that vessel then. So uh, that's something to keep in mind that we're a bit ahead on the software side here. So looking at booking of keys, looking at filling of water and consumption of shore power automatically, that's on the that's on the uh, docks then, on the key side. Now, I want to just move ahead to the gate for one more example of what we're pushing now with, uh, with a handful of ports and counting. And that's self-service model for, uh, for visits at port. So basically, you have temporary visits to ports, daytime passes, you could call them, People who, for a limited amount of time, would like access to your port to perform some sort of action, if it's an electrician or if it's a truck driver. Now, in the same application, you're able to make a profile. You're able to pre-book a time at the port with a given purpose. It's a push message to the one who receives it, approval. And when you have those smart integrations, with the gate, the gate will open and close at the arrival and departure then. And what, what you're doing here is that you're streamlining the internal processes, making it available 24 seven, resources internally, client can handle this bureaucratic process in a digital way, very good now, COVID-19, these things, not a bottleneck arriving at the gate or potentially filling papers, signing something at the uh, office. So this is something we believe in and we will push out for freight security agreements, also a digital database for this now, this autumn. So we hope to push a lot of the act actions done in the port towards self-service or towards the customer, allowing for the customer to be part of this experience. Looking a bit ahead, I think we're there quite soon. So that's why I wanted to use this image. 
I think most part, ports hearing what you guys have said in, your, uh, in this panel debate, I think we're close to connected ports. And the step towards that self-service port, empowering customers, reducing costs, offering good, great service 24 seven without necessarily more resources. I think we're there quite soon. And then we're one step ahead towards that great goal to be able to use data-driven digital tools to really step out, become modern, smart, green hubs. And me and my colleagues in Grid Connect, we're happy to be part of it. Contact me for more information. You got my email number here. There's a lot of development teams on port management system, terminal operating system, gate system, laser sharp predictions on ETA and event management. So we got a got a big toolbox and uh, we're ready to uh, to help you guys out. So on behalf of Grig, I just like to thank you all and have a nice afternoon and then we see you guys tomorrow. Smashing done. Some top shelf stuff available from Greg's shelf. Thank you very much. It seems that we have approach the end of our webinar and we that we are calling it a day a big thank you for spending this time with us a tip of the hat to our sponsors vrt grid connect and i we are returning tomorrow then in the morning central european time till then stay safe and healthy wash your hands wear a mask keep distance and laugh ports not only in the baltic thanks and cheers Thank <laughs> you.